Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so pleased to welcome you to this event with Veronica O'Keen, discussing her new book, A Sense of Self, Memory, the Brain, and Who We Are, in conversation with Ted Dynan. Today's event is a part of our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which brings the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and now very far beyond it. Uh, be on the lookout for some of our great science book talks coming up. On Monday, June 7th, we will be hosting Harvard professor Andrew Knoll for his latest book, A Brief History of Earth, Four Billion Years in Eight Chapters. To learn about the series, you can visit the webpage harvard.com slash science or sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com. Uh, we also have a YouTube page where you can view previous talks that you might have missed. Um, and I'm going to post links in the Zoom chat in just a few minutes. Today's event is going to conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speakers something, please go to the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen where you can submit a question. We're going to get through as many as time allows for. This event will also have closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom that you're using, you might need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. I would also like to say a tremendous thank you for your patronage during these strange virtual times. Your support makes this author series possible and ensures the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thanks to all of you for tuning in and showing up for authors, indie book selling, and especially for science. And finally, as you've likely experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues do arise. And if they do, we're gonna do our best to resolve them quickly or work through them. So thank you for your patience and your understanding. And now I am so pleased to introduce our speakers calling in from across the world. Dr. Veronica O'Keen is professor of psychiatry and consultant psychiatrist at Trinity College Dublin with over 35 years of experience in her field. An award-winning and prolific researcher, Dr. O'Keen's work studies mood disorders and perinatal depression. She's a fellow of the Irish College of Psychiatrists and A Sense of Self is her first trade book. Joining her in conversation tonight is Dr. Ted Dynan, professor of psychiatry at University College Cork, principal investigator at APC Microbiome Ireland, and medical director of Atlantia Food Clinical Trials. His research studies the brain-gut microbe axis, focusing on depression and IBS. This afternoon, they will be discussing Dr. O'Keen's new book, A Sense of Self, praised by The Guardian as vivid and immediate and affecting. Of the book, the London Observer writes, O'Keen's unforgettable trip down memories, many lanes, leaves you with a marveling awareness of what humans collectively share as memory makers, and at the same time reminds us that each one of us is a singular translator of our world. We are so pleased to host them for this afternoon's event. So without further ado, Dr. O'Keen and Dr. Dine in the digital podium is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kate. Um, I'm very grateful to Harvard Books for inviting me um, to this event and also to my friend and colleague, Ted Dynan, whom I believe to be one of the best scientists in the world. Um, it's always a privilege to talk to him and it's very special to talk about my book with him. I'm going to start, uh, Ted and I agreed that it would be best to start uh, with a small extract from the book to give you guys a flavor of what the book is about. The book is essentially about memory how we all make our memories and how those memories eventually make us. And this is an event from my life. The book is full of anecdotes from my life and from the lives of patients. But this particular memory is very vivid for me and it will open up a lot of the topics that Ted and I are going to discuss such as emotion and memory. So this is called the Cambridge Lovage story. It was the warm sunny summer of 1995. 
and I was in the early months of my first pregnancy. We had bought a 300 year old house with a garden so big that the back boundary was not visible to the eye from the kitchen door. If that summer you had followed the parched lawn down past the big oak tree and then the orchard, you would have entered an undergrowth with a thick smell of earth compost mixed with hot river vapor before seeing the river that marked the back boundary. The hot air, as stagnant as the shrunken river, had trapped spinning clouds of small river insects. The mesmeric unending sounds of the invisible crickets, possibly grasshoppers, extended into mellow fermata as if sound was also trapped. I found myself in a mood similar to the weather, suspended and absorbed by nature. And I spent a lot of my time that summer in the herb garden, laid out among flagstones by the back door. Most of the herbs had been planted by previous owners and I spent weekends over months restoring it, weeding out ivy, mint and lemon verbena and cutting back the lavenders and thymes that had gone to wood. One day during this lovely summer, I picked a bunch of herbs to flavor a salad. And I go on to tell the story of how I ate uh, something in the salad that made me feel sick. And uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was some greenery from, um, from the garden. And a week later, I was back in the garden and I had an immediate jolt of the uh, sickness that I had experienced a week before and knew instantly, as we all do, uh, that whatever it was that I'd smelt was the thing that had made me sick. And that memory stayed with me. And over the years, as neuroscience unfolded, I suppose, I understood uh, that memory uh, in terms of smell memory, odor memory, is very much caught up with emotion. So that when you smell something, you immediately have the associated feeling of that memory. In my case, it uh, was a smell of what we call in science disgust, or what we might call in um, nor normal parlance, um, nausea. So the, the, the memory of the smell, even though I was unaware of the smell, triggered this sense of nausea. And it really impressed upon me how clever our brains are, how much cleverer they are than we sometimes acknowledge. So the book is not just about memory as a repository of knowledge, it's about memory as an emotion, the human condition of, of feeling with memory. Thank you very much for that introduction, Veronica. Um, you must be delighted with the reception that the book has received so far, because I think what's unusual about the way in which it's been reviewed is the fact that you have very prominent literary figures like John Banville giving it a very positive review. And on the other hand, you have clinical scientists, I suppose, a bit like myself, saying very nice things about it as well. There are very few books that one sees where the one sees a bridge between, you know, literary criticism and scientific criticism. And the book seems very much to, you know, to, to, to have received positive regard on both sides. Now, as Kate mentioned in the introduction there, Veronica, you have a lot of clinical experience. You and I have worked as psychiatrists uh, for, for very extended periods of time. You, you've, you're obviously based in Dublin now, but you've worked in Cambridge in England. Uh, you've worked in King's College in London as well. So the patients you've seen over the years have influenced you and influenced this book. There's a flavor throughout the book of the influence that those patients have had on you. What type of patients would you think have had the greatest influence on the way you think about memory? Um, well, I suppose as a psychiatrist, um, unlike most people who are probably listening to us now, 
we treat the more severe end of the mental health spectrum. And the patients who are certainly dearest to my heart and probably to the heart of most psychiatrists are our patients who are the most severely unwell. So I would say patients who've had severe depression um, or who've had psychotic experiences, I found them very inspiring. Um, first of all, at the human level of what they endure and the fact that they endure it in a world that's largely unsympathetic to them. Um, and they make us all realize really how lucky we are to be able to understand the world in a coherent way. So I think that experience of humility is very life affirming. So that, that's, that's one way they've made an impression on me in terms of the way I've learned about the world of neuroscience, I think um, looking at these extremely abnormal experiences makes you think and makes you stop and wonder, you know, that all the things that we take for normal um, actually are very uh, complicated and they're not there automatically. And certainly you, one, one of the, um, opening, the opening chapter, in fact, of the book, I talk about a patient called Edith. And Edith had had a postpartum psychosis in which she believed that her baby had been substituted by the devil and that her husband was also an identical substitute. And of course, we call these um, delusions of substitution or misidentification. And this can ha happen very abruptly, as it did with Edith, just a few days following the birth of her baby, having never been um, psychologically unstable or certainly not psychiatrically unwell prior to that. And on passing the graveyard on her way to the hospital, she saw a small tilted um, gravestone. And she immediately knew from looking at that, that her baby was buried there and that the so her real baby was dead and the substitute baby um, was uh, part of the, the drama um, that was unfolding around her. And on, we treated her and she got better because that's what we do. And psychosis responds very well to treatment, uh, particularly in the postpartum period. So when she came back to see me, um, she passed the same graveyard and saw the crooked gravestone. And she explained to me when she arrived that she'd had a, a, an overwhelming sensation of being back in the moment of psychosis when she was um, first coming to the hospital. And she explained to me that uh, in that moment, she had a reliving of all of her psychotic experiences uh, the anxiety, the terror, the sense of everything around her um, uh, being staged and of everybody being fraudulent. And I said to her, as we do as psychiatrists, well, Edith, I, I hope you understand now that those memories were false, that that didn't really happen. And she said, uh, yes, I understand that it isn't true, but the memories are very real. And so the whole book is really based on that, on those words that Edith said to me, because then I began to understand that it doesn't matter what happens to you, um, whether it's a delusional belief or not, each person's memories are real and they're real because they experience them and you can modify them with present experience the way Edith did. But as she said to me, the memory was real. And it really brought home to me the fact that memory is neurally embedded experience, that our neurons make memories because of the world around us. And we're not choosing to make these memories. These memories are making us. So yes, to answer your question, yeah. all of my explorations have really been based upon 
very abnormal experiences from patients and translating those into normal human experience. Indeed. And of course, you know, as you and I well know, psychotic experiences, and you've described that there can be so awful for the individual and yet so common. I, people forget, and I think our, our colleagues in general medicine often forget how common psychotic illnesses are. I was talking to a colleague from UCLA there a few years ago, and he was asking me, why are there so many psychiatrists around? Why don't we have more gastroenterologists? And, uh, you know, I, I had to point out to him that, you know, ulcerative colitis is common and so is Crohn's disease, but they have a prevalence of about one, one in 2000, whereas, you know, the sort of psychotic illnesses you're discussing, prevalence of, you know, one in 100 with schizophrenia, maybe two in 100 with bipolar illness. So we're really looking at something that is so central to to the human condition, uh, you know, with such a, such a, an incredibly high prevalence. Now, your book is very much focused on memory. And I suppose a lot of psychiatrists and a lot of psychologists will be familiar with traditional ways of looking at memory and the traditional ways as you have encoding and you have, you know, the lay down of memory and you have retrieval and so forth. The view you're putting forward is more complex than that. How, how, you know, you, how do you see your view in comparison to the traditional view of memory? Um, thanks for that question, Ted. Yes, what, what you say is, is, is true. I suppose when you and I were in college, we learned about memory in a very piecemeal way. We learned um, from psychology about the cognitive aspects, how to measure memory, short-term memory, long-term memory. We learned about memory in compartments. We learned about memory from the point of view of uh, event memory and knowledge memory. We didn't actually learn about the experience of memory. And I think that you know, we, we live our memories as human beings. We are actually, uh, the, the, the human condition is um, really a combination of conscious experience in the world around us and sensation and interpreting that through memory. And I think somehow or other in the various faculties and within the various specialties, we lose that overall sense of the human condition and what memory means um, as, we, uh, as we live life. And I think psychiatry gives us these unique insights really in terms of living normal memory. You know, it, it's fantastic the, um, the education, the public education that we've seen about Alzheimer's disease and dementias in general. And that really teaches us a lot about how to manage them. Again, dementia obviously is a very common illness and it's only set to get more common, but that's really about understanding fading memory and helping us as a society and as individuals, carers, loved ones, families, and friends to understand people whose memory is fading. But I feel that the process of living experience, which is what memory is for me, hasn't been considered in the same way. Um, mm -hmm. And in neuroscience, I suppose neuroscience is, you know, obviously you and I are both neuroscientists and we've been fascinated by the brain and in our careers, really brain science has come to the fore and we know so much more now than we did when we started off. But there, there isn't a sense for me of uh, the experience of memory. And I think bringing psychiatry and neuroscience together in this way um, helps people, readers, I hope, to, to understand their own um, experiences as they go through life. Yeah. Now. In, in the book, Veronica, you use the term make our brains. And it's a term that you kind of use, you know, um, which 
maybe you might elaborate on it. What exactly do you mean by that, that we make our brains? Um, well, I suppose the world makes our brains as well as ourselves. Sure. But um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going back to the idea that I, stay, that I think still lingers culturally. Um, it's a philosophical point, but it's a very important point that there is an a priori knowledge. Um, you know, we, we are not born with knowledge. We are born not necessarily with an entirely blank slate because what happens in utero influences our brain development as, as you know. I mean, in fact, you would say that the way you're born um, might even, yeah. the method of birth, sure. uh, whether it's sure. a C-section or being born yeah. um, through the vagina, uh, that that would influence um, our bodies. So there are all sorts of forces at play, but I guess the only things that we're we can measure as yet really as what happens post-birth and basically uh, whatever way a baby is born post-birth their brains uh, really continue to develop for, for the next 20 30 years of their life and only reach maturity at that point and our brains are made from the process of memory because the hippocampus at the center of the brain is like a memory factory uh, where all the neurons connect up together to make patterns. And essentially, it's the patterns of the connecting up of the neurons that form specific memories. And these memories then become elaborated with emotions. And so when we remember something, uh, an event memory, there's um, the play cells from the hippocampus there's the associated emotion from the location uh, parts of our brain, which is essentially the hippocampus. And then that all gets transported up to the front of the brain so that we can consciously see it, imagine it and predict for future events. So, um, yeah, the, 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 uh, the world that we live in makes these memories. And I guess the, in the sense that we have a genetically uh, determined uh, brain, um, obviously our eyes are all different colors, our hands are all different shapes and so on and so forth. So our brains are also very unique. We have a unique genetic signature for our brains. So the, it's, it's the unique combination of the person's individually genetic determined brain and their very individual experience that gives each person a highly individualized memory map, um, an imprint um, that's very unique to them. Yeah. So you view, and I, 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 it's a view I would share, that the brain is a very plastic organ, you know, that it, you know, it, it's plastic in the sense that it's constantly changing in response to environmental stimuli. And obviously maybe early on those environmental stimuli can have a greater impact than they would be later on. I suppose the only other part of the body that might be as plastic as that, and I know it's one area of the body that you've, you know, published on previously, would be the adrenal cortex. You know, I think patients are often surprised that, you know, if somebody is depressed, their adrenal cortex can become massively enlarged. And when they're no longer depressed, it, it returns back to a normal size. So, it, you know, unlike many, I mean, one wouldn't regard the heart as a, a particularly plastic organ, but clearly the brain actually is. But, you know, you mentioned the hippocampus, but do you really believe that there's an engram or that there's an area of the brain associated with memory? Because as I read your book, I kind of, it reminded me of the work of Carl Lashley in Harvard, who you know, was spent decades looking for the engram or the site at which memories are stored. And of course, he came to the conclusion eventually that in fact, memory involves the whole brain. And although you're mentioning the hippocampus, you're not really saying that hippocampus is the storage area because 
There are so many other areas, the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex. You know, it really is the whole brain. It's the whole structure. There's no one part, is there, where memory is laid down. It's the whole brain, really, isn't it? Absolutely, Ted. Um, I'm completely at one with you there. I've, I've deliberately called the hippocampus the memory maker. Um, so in the sense that we um, connect up time and place, the hippocampus is, is very important. But of course, and again, this relates to the way we learned about the brain. We learned it in a very piecemeal way. You know, we learned the hippocampus sure. does this, the amygdala is the emotion center, the prefrontal cortex is where everything is brought together and um, it mediates consciousness and imagination and prediction. But of course, the brain is one massively, you know, uh, fantastically connected structure. There are 68 billion neurons in our brain and there are 15,000, up to 15,000 dendritic connections between each neuron. Mm, sure. And I totally agree with you. The, the reason we understand memory in the hippocampus is because the hippocampus is quite simple. It has basically a four neuron structure and mm. we can see how the neurons connect up there to some extent and it maps place predominantly. So that can be seen because animals can recognize places and humans can memorize places. So we, we look at the hippocampus to help us understand memory really. Having said that, I do think that time and place are incredibly central to human memory. And I've written separate chapters about these because um, we, we remember really through place. And uh, I, I suppose in Ireland as well, we're, uh, we're, a, we're a small country and we're, we are very involved in the local, you know, there's traditions, there's folklore, and it's all very specific for each place. We have small islands, specific accents, specific places. And we do locate quite a lot. This, this world of the connected internet is very strange for people coming from a sparsely populated island where we are very, have a very strong sense of place. Indeed. So yeah, the hippocampus is a memory maker, but of course the way memory is stored, it's stored throughout the cortex. So it's really yeah. the surface of the brain and the emotional structures under the brain. They're all, it's, it's just one big, filamentous uh, mess and um, yeah so yeah. you know it, when, it's, it, when it's, you it, trigger it, one bit of the brain another bit of the brain goes off so yeah indeed and it is interesting that when you look at cab drivers in new york or in london they tend to if you scan their brains they have bigger hippocampi than than, than you or i probably do um to get back to the concept of psychosis when what role do you think memory plays there in the emergence of psychosis well i think it's very difficult to have a coherent sense of the world if the sensation coming into you, uh, into your brain, is not coherent. So, for example, we don't know why people hallucinate, but, uh, and it's, you know, I think it's, it's difficult to imagine a lot of psychotic um, experiences. But I suppose when you think of a child who's developing, and schizophrenia, of course, starts in uh, young adulthood, um, you know, often in mid-teenage years. And it's probably not picked up until the young adult is 17 or 18, but it's probably been there for quite a while. 
And of course, you're having these, the, the, the psychotic individual is having these abnormal experiences. For example, hearing voices um, and not, not voices like calling your name. These are kind of benign auditory hallucinations, but voices that are very alien and are threatening, maybe threatening to kill the, the person or two people discussing how pathetic the person is who's having these auditory hallucinations. And again, it's important to remember that these hallucinations are usually highly derogatory and distressing. And of course, if you hear uh, voices, you're going to, like everybody else, look around and try and locate their origin. And because you can't locate the origin of the voices, you make up a story like we all do to a narrative to explain the voices. And of course, suddenly you're laying down stories that are what we would call false, but they're not really false because the person is really trying to make some, trying to bring some cohesion and sense to a world um, in which they are experiencing abnormal sensations. So they make up stories like the voices are coming from the neighbors and the neighbors are trying to kill them. So when they see the neighbors drive off in the car, they wonder if they've left you know, a bomb in their house, if they've switched cameras on, how they're going to kill them. So these memories, these experiences and these stories get laid down as memories and then you get the development of delusions to explain these strange sensations and I suppose more and more then the person becomes emerged in this memory system this story that explains the abnormal experiences and so you're at the beginning of a psychotic delusional belief system in which the individual becomes paranoid and feels threatened and persecuted. So without memory, I, I don't think people would develop delusional systems. Yeah, sure. And, and uh, yes, as you, as you yeah. point out, Veronica, I mean, neuroscience in, in recent decades ha has focused on memory and the underlying biology of memory, but really, the point you're making, and I think it's a very, very valid point, is that psychiatry as a discipline has undervalued the role of memory. I mean, not so much, obviously, in something like Alzheimer's disease, but in something like the psychotic illnesses that you and I would treat on a daily basis. Do you think that there's any improvement in that? Or do you think that really psychiatry has a long way to go or really needs to change focus? Um, well, I think psychiatry has a long way to go, yes, because psychiatry has been struggling against Freud for a century. And, um, you know, Freud didn't actually believe in, uh, even though he was originally a neurologist, but he believed that mental illness had a cause and that that narrative lays somewhere in your external world. But, uh, you know, we now have a more enlightened view of serious mental illness as being a brain disease. So, uh, yeah, I think psychiatry is still, and, and, you know, culturally, I think the world is still to a large extent seeing mental illness as always having a reason and always having a cause. And um, I, I think we've ignored the experience of psychosis and how it impacts on a brain and how it changes a brain and how it makes a brain. So I would really invoke neuroscience. I think what's really missing, if you like, in psychiatry is neuroscience and the developments within neuroscience in the same way that I think neuroscience is missing experience. So I think bringing neuroscience and psychiatry together to both look at the way the brain makes experience, to look at the way the brain makes memory and the, the biology of it, because it's within that biology that the pathology in schizophrenia and in serious mood disorders lie. 
So we, we have a lot to learn from neuroscience and I think yeah. neuroscience has a lot to learn from us. But yeah, I, 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 I think the, the legacy of Freud has been very toxic. And I think it has very, you know, it was adversely influenced um, psychiatry, but we are emerging from that. And I am hopeful that we're moving into an era in which people have um, more awareness of the experience of Indeed. psychosis. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, well, I suppose. What do you think? I, I think that, you know, when you look at Freud, and I would be equally critical of Freud, Freudian theory, but a lot of it is fossilized, isn't it? I mean, I believe that if Freud were wrong today, he'd probably be in neuroscience. I mean, at the end of the day, he did some very interesting early work on local anesthesia. You know, he was biologically oriented, but there was such a limitation in terms of technologies. There were no technologies available, really, for looking at the bio of the brain. I, I think that those Freudians who rigidly adhere to psychodynamic psychotherapy you know, are fossilized in a different era. And I don't think Freud, if he were around in the 21st century, would be sticking to psychodynamic psychotherapy at all. He'd throw it out the door, you know, and, and move on to, to more a more biological understanding of the way in which, you know, brain processes operate and psychiatric illnesses emerge. Um, but, um, you know, w w would you feel equally negative about, let's say, Jungian views on the collective unconscious and things like that? Presumably you would. I'm um, no, Ted, actually, I wouldn't. I have a particularly visceral response to Freud um, because of his misogyny. Um, sure. I, I, I cannot forgive him for um, saying that young girls whom he knew were being abused by their fathers and by people around them, that they had, uh, they were sexually attracted to their fathers and they had penis envy. I just find that uh, sure. repugnant. Bizarre. And yeah. I yeah. like Young, actually. Yeah. yeah. I like Young because I think Young, yeah, he was he was mystical, but he was picking out patterns that I find very interesting in the same way that I find fairy stories very interesting. I think the the you know what he was picking up about archetypes is very much what um, the gods were in ancient Greece. And um, you know the the, the stories that uh, abounded in folklore in Irish fairy tales. So I quite like Young actually, and he's nice yeah. to read, yeah. and he doesn't um, doesn't tell yeah. you things all the time. It's um, it's more lyrical and it's less pompous. Yeah. Well, a few years ago, I published a paper called the Collective Unconscious, How Microbes Communicate with the Brain. And I suspect a lot of people read it thinking that they were going to learn something about Jung. I don't know much about Jung, really, you know, maybe I know a little about microbes in the brain. But um, anyway, he, 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 he has. So had could, I, could I ask? For sure. Please. Can I ask you a question, Ted, because I'm very yeah. interested in um biological memory and the fact that the microbes that you talk about um we've evolved from those um essentially they sure. share a lot of our proteins yeah. we're yeah. now embodying them and they're affecting yeah. our brain indeed and of yeah. course you've coined the term psychobiotics yeah. so how does that relate to memory do you think well i think that you know <laughs> When you were I and I were in medical school, we clearly learned that there were bacteria in our intestine, there were commensal, they did us no harm, but they didn't do us any good either. And I think over the last 15 years or so, we're beginning to appreciate that that massive bacteria in the intestine, it's, it's over a kilogram in weight, over two pounds in weight in the average adult, that 
these microbes produce a large array of molecules that our brains absolutely require. Um, if you look at, let's say, if you, uh, you know, for many years, and I've published many papers in germ-free animals where they have no microbes in their intestine, and their memory system is seriously defective. So unless one evolves with microbes in the intestine, normal memory function does not evolve at all. Now, I suppose the question is, how do microbes actually communicate with the brain? They do so in a number of ways. The vagus nerve is obviously a very long meandering nerve that connects the brain and the gut and does send signals up and down. But there are molecules produced that play a very important role as well. Short chain fatty acids are produced by microbes and like butyrate and propionate. And they're actually epigenetic modulators. They actually influence the way in which certain genes in the brain operate and I'm sure have an influence in relation to memory. And then of course, you know, I, our group were, were the first to show that bifidobacteria can produce tryptophan. Now, it, it used to be said 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that we need a tryptophan for serotonin because it's the building block of serotonin and that all the tryptophan came from the diet. But of course, we now know that actually microbes are capable of synthesizing tryptophan and a whole array of other molecules, including neurotransmitters. Now, I don't believe those neurotransmitters go to the brain or anything like that. But there's no doubt about it that the overall role of the microbiota in shaping brain function is, is, is vast. Um, and it undoubtedly plays a significant role in relation to memory. As I say, if you don't, if an animal doesn't have a gut microbiota, it doesn't have normal memory functioning, which is quite intriguing. Um, and there's a window of opportunity where you can add a microbiota where normal memory function will emerge. But if you go beyond that window, the animal will be left cognitively impaired, basically. You know, so I think factors outside the brain, you know, clearly do have a, and, and you allude to this in your book as well, do have a, an impact on how the brain functions and how, 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 how memory processes, uh, you know, uh, occur. Um, now, we might just look at one other issue, which you, you and, address. And that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Please, no, no, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, th there's one other issue that yeah, you no, raise. no. What I was going to say is, I, yeah. I think our environment, yeah, our environment is not just the world around us, but it's our bodies as well. And I think your point about how gut microbiota, um, you know, essentially uh, cause neural activity in our brain through the vagus nerve, or how they might stimulate chemical, neurochemical processes in the brain is a great example of how our, the introceptive world, as well as the extraceptive world in the world around us, but our bodies are feeding into our brain the whole time. And they are um, making the memories as well, the emotions we feel in our bodies. So it's, uh, memory is everything in a sense, it's everything from it within us and yeah. from without us as well. Indeed. And that, that brings us on to an issue which you do raise in the book as well. And that's the sense of self and how the sense of self and memories are so intimately connected. Could you, could you elaborate on that for us a little, please? Um, yeah, well, I, I guess uh, identity is a very complex thing um, and you know I think when we're talking about identity we're talking about um, how we fit into the social world um, but it's it's much more complicated than that and I suppose uh, you know it's it's more complicated than social affiliation and I suppose the way that we uh, memorize the world the way that the world comes at us because of the kind of memory filter we have, because of the way our brains are structured, because of the experiences we have, very much, this all comes together and gives us 
in adulthood um, and in childhood, uh, a sense of what oneself is. And you, it's so basic that it's difficult to imagine, but some of our patients with uh, schizophrenia, they don't know that they are themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get a very good idea of how basic one sense of self is when you see people who don't have a sense of self. These individuals with psychosis, they have what are called passivity experiences. They believe their thoughts are being put into their heads or emotions are being put into their bodies or they are influencing somebody else's thoughts. So they don't have a coherent sense of who they are. And, um, you know, in milder forms of uh, a lack of brain cohesion, people might slip from very easily from different gender identities and um, different social affiliations and so on and so forth. But in, in psychosis, there is no sense of self because there are no coherent memories. There is no coherent way of processing sensation. And so I, I, I suppose what I'm saying is that we are all, all of us who have a sense of ourselves, um, we're very, very lucky. And uh, we're lucky that that mechanism operates and having an identity is something beyond that again. So that's why I use the word, a sense of self. Sure. Now, throughout the book, there are lots of literary references and you, uh, and there are a diverse range of literary references. You do quote heavily from some of the existential literature, Samuel Beckett, Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, do you think that existentialism as such or existential literature can really throw a light on the complex issue of memory? Uh, yes, I do. And I suppose, again, when we were growing up, there wasn't a neuroscience of of memory in the way that we understand it now. And we certainly didn't have a neuroscience of consciousness. And I think essentially what the existentialists were exploring was consciousness. But of course, uh, in the previous century, you know, great uh, philosophers like Henri Bergson said, you know, consciousness is memory. And it's, it's an awareness of processing uh, experience in the context of an individual memory. And the existential writers explored this before we understood what it was. So uh, I, I learned about mental experience um, from reading these uh, existential writers. And of course, they were pushing the frontiers of uh, of mental life and the human condition through their writings. And I stand, you know, in awe of, of these sure. people who just plunge themselves into a selfless uh, introspection in a sense and um, try to, you know, sometimes it was very harrowing, um, but to bring these experiences to the world um, and I suppose we're, we're lucky because uh, as Irish people, we had James Joyce who really made, you know, he, he wrote three novels. And in these three novels, he, you know, he pushed out the boundaries of consciousness and really explored the way a person lives through sensation in one's memories. So... And I, I still think the experiences that they've written down, uh, I think the day that neuroscience understands all that, uh, we'll be long dead, Ted. Absolutely. I think that's definitely true, Veronica. But thank you very much indeed. I think we have an opportunity to take a few questions uh, from the audience. So if I can find them here. Um, The first question is an interesting question, Veronica. What made you decide to write a trade book at this stage in your career? 
Um, I think I've been publishing in neuroscience and that's really, it's really fun being sort of at the frontier, meeting colleagues internationally and nationally. It's very exciting, but I'm, I'm not sure how much of it uh, gets out there unless you're studying immunology at the moment or yeah. um, autoimmunity. Uh, so, well, you know, what you publish about is of, of great general interest, you know, it just, it happens to coincide, what you do scientifically is of great interest to the public. But um, I guess what I really wanted to do, I was frustrated by the fact that psychiatric illnesses and the sufferers from psychiatric illnesses um, are, are not analysed in a scientific way so it was sure. really a frustration at the lack of understanding about mental illness in general and the stigmatization of illness and also the understandings that I've learned as somebody who has lived through the emergence of neuroscience bringing those insights to people in general to give people a language um, and why did I do it at this stage um, Probably memories, you know, the accumulation of memories that I was really only able to work out, I'd say, in the last decade. Sure. Because sure. a lot of what I saw in the first few decades, I didn't understand it. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah. And actually, the next question kind of links I've up with that. I've always wanted to try. Veronica, it says that you talk uh, uh, very beautifully about young, Young's patterns. Do you think that so much of your work and this particular book in protect, particular comes from spending decades really listening to people, picking up the specific patterns that come out across our human stories. I mean, it's a, it is very much a, a, a work that is, you couldn't have written this in the first five years of your career, could you? No, no, that's a nice question. And I, yeah. Yes, I think it is. It is true. And as Ted said, um, yeah, it, it's um, as Ted said, it does relate very much to the the first question, which is, I think you spend a lot of time seeing patterns. At least that's what I did for maybe 20 years of my career, seeing patterns and then almost knowing within a few minutes what's wrong with somebody because you've built the patterns that you see into, obviously into a memory network. And um, then, you know, you're, you're trying to match this to new knowledge that's coming into your brain um, in terms of neuroscience. So patterns, yeah. I mean, memory, yeah. neuronal patterns, the way we see the world is all about patterns. So absolutely. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. The next question is, I, I, I suppose, a more neuroscience oriented question. Do you think memory is an epigenetic phenomenon? Um, I think it's, I think it is, everything is epigenetic, I suppose. Yeah. And everything is genetic, um, but it's not exclusively genetic, epigenetic or environmental. And I suppose epigenetics is the way that the environment and the um uh, you know the the conditions that you live in will modify your genes but epigenetics is hugely important for memory because it will determine our stress responses and we know that so for example okay. if you've had a a very difficult childhood um if you've been abused abused it's going to change your stress responses and that's done epigenetically and those altered stress responses will modify your memories and predict patterns of um, bad things happening to you so everything is connected with everything and epigenetics is I guess it's the way that the environment, both good and bad, and the events that happen to us, both good and bad, modify our memory networks and modify the way we respond to the world. And so it's a, uh, it, it's a circle of memory predicting responses and responses then uh, 
determining the world's response to you. So yeah, it's very much epigenetics. Great. We'll take two more questions, Veronica. The, the next one is an interesting one. I'm sure it's one that you and I and anyone who's worked in psychology or psychiatry and, or counselling has thought about. Do you make a distinction between the brain and the mind? No. Um, I think it's all brain. There are certain things that happen to us as human beings that we um, attribute to the mind, and that's absolutely fine. But uh, I, I think the mind doesn't so much exist as a part of the brain rather than as a human experience. Um, I suppose, you know, I, I think, for example, what people would call spirituality is an emotional experience. It's a very real experience. You know, we can experience transcendent moments um, in religious ceremonies, if you're swimming and if uh, you're running for two marathons like you do, possibly, mm. um, you can have transcendent moments sec secondary to psychedelics. These are not mind experiences, in my view, they're brain experiences, but it's okay, I think, to use the word mind, but I think it's important also to remember that there are not two things. We're not composed of the worldly and the otherworldly, or the material and the non-material, that it's all ultimately brain and that we're massively complex with massive ranges of experiences. And one final question, uh, Veronica, and maybe if there are any other questions come in, maybe you might um, respond to them by text uh, after the session. But the next question is, how reliable really is memory? I mean, two people can remember the same event in very different ways, each thinking their recollection is correct. Um, well, if you're talking about memory as a reliable predictor or a reliable um, account of past events, it's not at all reliable. Um, but memory, because every time you recall a memory, you disrupt it and it will form in a marginally different way. It will reform in a marginally different way. So current experience is constantly modifying our memory. And what, uh, so, so as a reliable indicator of past events, it's absolutely useless. As a process of understanding the world, it's, um, it's brilliant. Thank you very much, Veronica. That was a really lovely conversation. Great to touch base with you. Um, Thanks very much, Ted. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Well, thank you tremendously to both Dr. O'Keen and Dr. Dynan for this fascinating discussion and for all of you for contributing such thoughtful questions um, during the event tonight um, or this afternoon, wherever you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> We're all in different places. Um, if you would like to learn more, copies of A Sense of Self are for sale on harvard.com via the links I provided in the chat. So on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, have a great Tuesday. Keep reading and please be well. Thank you.